I just want to welcome everybody to another installment of the South Atlantic LCC. So Thursday web forum, and today we have um, a really neat presentation, um, one that's near and dear to the South Atlantic staff and our web community um, and uh, cooperative members, and because our very own Rua and Amy Keister um, are going to be presenting um, some of the preliminary findings from the LCC indicator models. So uh, through these Scope Thursday web forums, we uh, like to have a two-way conversation with other people and organizations who make up the cooperative. So um, just uh, before we get into it, some preliminary logistics. Um, we're going to be muting everybody. Um, so uh, at the end, there'll be some time for um, open discussion, and you can star six um, to unmute and uh, participate in a conversation. Um, so. Well, I'm going to do some introductions of the South Atlantic staff, and then as I mentioned, Amy and Rua are going to be doing a, a 20 to 30 minute presentation on um, the status of the South Atlantic LCC indicator models to date. Um, we'll then have uh, some time for some open questions and a discussion of the monthly topic or the indicator models if anybody uh, needs further clarification. Um, and then we'll have a brief update from the state of the South Atlantic LCC and some further questions and discussions. And uh, just some maintenance and housekeeping things. Um, we'll uh, have plenty of time afterwards for chatting. So um, if you have any questions between the presentation, feel free to use the um, chat application on the WebEx presentation. I'll be monitoring that. So if you have any questions, feel free to send them that way. Or wait till the end when um, we open it up for um, question and comments. So um, right now I'm going to mute everybody. And we can um, start presentations. So South Atlantic folks, remember to start six to give yourself a little introduction. Good morning. This is Kenny Dorman. I'm the coordinator for the South Atlantic SEC. And this is uh, Will Mordecai. So I'm the science coordinator for your cooperative. Hi, this is Amy Keister. I'm the GIS coordinator for your cooperative. Yeah, Lori Barrow here, and I'm the information transfer specialist, and I serve as the Forest Service liaison for the South Atlantic. It's still on mute there, Janet. <laughs> Sounds like Janet's on on, on mute, uh, so Janet to here, the climate change socioeconomic coordinator for the South Atlantic. Um, I think is on the call as well. Mm -hmm. All right, so should we get started? Sorry, I was having some trouble with my mute button as well. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, yeah, we lost it. We lost it. Well, I'm having some trouble this morning. Yeah, so um, again, I just want to uh, mention, um, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to use that chat application. I really appreciate the feedback. I know all of us do. Um, so uh, take it away, Amy and uh, Rua. All right, excellent. So um, we, we scheduled this, this uh, web forum, and it's going to be a series of ones about some of the South Atlantic indicators. Um, in advance, he gave you sort of an early peek in what we've modeled so far on, on the indicators. But um, also, I thought it'd be important to take a quick step back, too, and talk a little bit about, you know, not just the indicator models themselves, but the South Atlantic blueprint and how this fits into a bigger picture. Uh, so um, as you all probably remember, because we say it every time we talk, that, you know, that now the two to four year mission of the South Atlantic is, is to come up with this shared blueprint for landscape conservation actions to sustain natural and cultural resources. So I thought I'd step a little bit back um, before we got into some examples of what we've modeled so far. So first off, this idea of conservation blueprints, um, so some kind of geospatial depiction um, you know, about where we need to take action uh, to maintain the things we care about. It's, it's not a new idea. And there's lots of examples out there, Florida's Cliff, Wildlife Action Plans, Eco-Regional Assessments, um, where, where folks have come together and put together some kind of geospatial depiction of, of where we need to take action. The obvious question here is, so what's so different from past efforts? Why is this so important for the, for the South Atlantic as a whole, all of us as a cooperative? Uh, to do. And it's really about three things that are, that are different from past efforts. The first one is that we're planning for a cooperative. 
not any one organization. So everyone gets a vote. We all come together here. It's not any organization inviting partners together to plan um, for them. It's all of us planning collectively. The other thing is that this is an adaptation strategy. So we're incorporating climate change, urban growth, other future changes to try to figure out what do we need to do in the face of the epic changes we're seeing here in the, in the South Atlantic. And the last thing is it's a bigger scope and scale than we've dealt with before. We're not just talking aquatics, not just terrestrial, not just marine, you know, not just a watershed um, or a group of watersheds, a pretty large ecological region and a, a large suite of resources, including natural and cultural. So these three things uh, make this a South Atlantic uh, conservation blueprint. Uh, in a pretty good position to be used in a number of ways. I get this question a lot, you know, how, how is this blueprint going to be used? What are these indicators adding up to? So here's a few of the, the different use cases. Um, one is the most obvious one, I would say, you know, finding the best places to work together. You know, if, you, if we all come together to collectively for shared measures of things we care about and a shared plan to take action, that's a pretty nice way of measuring where we can get the most bang for the buck, where we can sort of put our funds together. The second one is bringing in some new conservation dollars. I mean, we've got some great, amazing relationships in the South Atlantic, and there are some real nice opportunities to capitalize that to bring some new dollars into the region from particularly national sources. So I've had a, we've been having conversations with a number of foundations and nonprofits, you know, groups like Trust for Public Land, saying, boy, if you could, you know, if everyone can get on the same page in the conservation community and tell us, okay, these are the places we need to focus our, say, conservation ballot initiatives, yeah, we'll go work there. And had a number of conversations with, with NIFWIF that's seen this South Atlantic effort, the blueprint, the indicators, what we're doing, um, very much in line with, with their mission. And it's been thinking, boy, if you can get down to the business plan level, you know, being able to say if we invest this many millions of dollars, we'll get these measurable things out of it, um, then it may be on the way to being an initiative uh, that NIFWIC supports as well. So there's a lot of interesting opportunities there. Another case is about infrastructure development. I uh, had some conversations with, there's, um, with transportation folks, both state and federal, that are real interested in you know, figuring out, okay, where are the places we want our future infrastructure to go, and where do we not want to go? Now, there's huge, you know, lots of money at stake to help get conservation done and help guide where our structure goes in the future. Same thing with urban communities, interest in regional space, open space plans, um, talk with a lot of folks that say, boy, there's some real opportunities in our growing urban community to help them, um, you know, grow green space in the places that are most important to build a larger habitat network. Uh, there's the fourth case about incentives and alternatives to regulation. You know, none of us in the region want new regulation and anything we can do to um, kind of offset that with proactive um, measures is always great. So we have the, obviously, the sort of mega petition stuff on endangered species, huge flow issues coming. So, you know, collectively getting ahead of some of those things, um, you know, could be a pretty powerful application. Another piece is, is figuring out how all these local uh, adaptation efforts we're all doing fit into something bigger. You know, I mean, we're all out there you know, working on things, you know, oyster reef restorations and, you know, migrating, uh, you know, using shells instead of permanent pavement so we can respond to sea level rise, um, you know, collecting plants and genes. But, you know, if you look across the literature, some of the, the major climate adaptation strategies are really landscape scale. You know, it's connectivity, it's facilitating movement. That's the kind of stuff you can't do on, you know, within one organization or within one individual land unit. You have to be part of something bigger. So this can help figure out, okay, how do these, all these efforts we're already doing fit, fit into a bigger adaptation strategy? And the last one is just responding to major disasters. You know, Gulf oil spill, Hurricane Sandy, you know, huge amounts of conservation dollars at stake and a huge interest in, you know, okay, how, where do we need to invest fund to build resilience into um, our ecological systems? And so that's another way we could be ready for the next disaster um, in a more cohesive, longer-term thinking way. So we could have a collective vision of where we as a conservation community need to build out our ecosystems. Um, so that's a, a sixth case there. So those are just a few examples of, of use cases. 
And I have the steps of the blueprint broken down in really three pieces. So it's the indicators and targets. So uh, most of you on the phone will remember the, the process we went through to get South Atlantic indicators and targets, our shared measures of success. Um, and then we're calling the state of the South Atlantic. So we got these indicators and targets. What's the past, present, and future condition of them? You know, where, where were they, where are they now, and where are they going? Um, and then finally, a, a conservation, the blueprint itself. What's that spatially explicit map of how we're going to keep those indicators in the green? I'm going to go through these real quick, and when we go to the state of the South Atlantic, I'll, we'll be going through some of the, um, the models we're using and uh, some of the early results. So first, on the indicators and targets, um, for those that haven't been super immersed in the indicator process in the South Atlantic, quick reminder about definitions the South Atlantic has chosen. Um, when I say goal, I'm talking about a conservation outcome we want that's hard to measure. Uh, integrity of forested wetlands sounds great, but really hard to measure. Um, and the indicators are basically the way we measure that. Um, and then target is that measurable endpoint for an indicator. You know, what's, what's green look like? How much, how much is enough? Those, those kind of questions. Broad goals of the South Atlantic, we have the natural, the cultural, and the socioeconomic resources. I'm talking a lot about the natural resources this time, um, but we're making progress on cultural resource indicators um, as well, and so we may be able to fold those in and talk more about them in the next few web forums. Uh, so that we may have some cultural resource, uh, particularly historic resource um, indicators uh, in the next few months. So the natural resources, uh, it's all about the integrity of a series of ecological systems, um, with the caveat that if inte ecological integrity is not enough, we may need to revisit to ensure the viability of certain key species. So the viability species is sort of a, we think ecological integrity will take care of it, but we may need to revisit it. And then in that broader goals, we have a series of ecosystems. So we have landscapes, all about con connectivity across the terrestrial systems, and waterscapes, all about connectivity across the aquatic systems. So this is going from our you know, headwaters, the rivers, and streams, all the way out through the estuaries into the marine systems. Um, so that's that, those connections. And then we have the, the other ecosystems, beaches and dunes, forested wetlands, uh, nested within each of these. So all of these are on their way to becoming um, you know, these more broadly defined habitats and formalized and nature serve um, classifications. Um, and within each of these are nested the more detailed ecological systems of nature serve. And same thing for the estuarine and marine um, nests comes from the CMEX classification standard. So all these nest within larger standard classifications. Um, now I talk too much about the indicator review other than we had a ton of it. Most people on the line were part of it in some way, shape, or form, um, including feedback from the other adjacent LCCs uh, to try to get a feel for which indicators we may be able to share across LCC boundaries. And there are a lot of smart people on the selection team that took all that feedback and turn it into the indicators we have right now. I'll give you a couple of the example indicators and then I'll talk about some, some more of them as we're modeling. So we have uh, things like bird index for the pine woodlands, savannas, and prairie birds. So you see the species that are on there. So there's a collection of species. The target there is to meet partners and flight population objectives for all species. Um, for the estuarine, we have things like the index of coastal condition. So this is more of a systems level, water quality, sediment quality, benthic habitat, so combined symbiotic and abiotic measures. Um, a lot of folks on the coast contribute to this, and the target there is for all parameters to rank at least good in our estuary, so the South Atlantic. And then the freshwater aquatic, and I'm going to show you a little bit on this later, uh, percent impervious cover. So the goal here is to maintain the percent of catchments with 10% or less impervious cover in the region. So those are a few examples. Now I'm going to go into the state of the South Atlantic. So this is what, we're, what Amy and I have been working on um, a lot and will continue to be working on for a while now, um, which is taking these indicators that you all chose and we all camp with as a cooperative, and um, let's see the past, present, future condition of, of all of them. So really what this is doing is taking 
landscape scale structures we have out in the landscape. So this is a standardized threat taxonomy from the open standards for the practice of conservation, um, working on having this shared across all southeast LCCs. So we're using the same terminology. Um, so we have things you would expect, residential commercial development, pollution, invasives, and then trying to then move these indicators into the future based on what we can model from those stressors and then calculate ecosystem integrity. So the framework right now for integrity is each ecosystem has three indicators. So for indicator one, what's the percentage of our target we met? Indicator two, percent of the target we met. Three, percent of the target we met. And then the overall integrity is the percent of all of our ecosystem targets we've met. So that's right now the framework for, for rolling up all these pieces. So now I'm um, just going to drill into a few of these and, and show you some examples of, of progress we've made so far. Again, everything's very draft, but we wanted to make sure you get a chance to sort of peek under the curtain. There'll be lots of opportunities for looking at these, these different models and, and GIS layers um, as, as they come out. So you can take a look at them, point out any issues, or make any suggestions before they become final. Uh, so the first one we're going to talk about um, has actually been one of the more interesting, challenging ones. Uh, which is one of our landscape indicators. It's interior natural communities. This is contiguous natural habitat greater than 200 meters from an anthropogenic edge. So that's urban, ag, roads. So if you think about the component of the system we're talking about, this is the sort of the, the big patch size. Um, so patch size as a landscape configuration. Uh, the target was to double acres and patches of at least 10,000 acres. Um, and and obviously this is one of the many targets we'll probably be revisiting after looking at the future. Um, and the data we're using, um, Amy will talk a little more detail, for so the past right now is the NLCD from 92 and 2001, current the NLCD from 2006, and future NLCD, but burned in future urban growth and the SLAM sea level rise model. So moving the, that into 2050 based on urban growth and, and climate change. So with that, I'm going to let Amy take it away here. Thank you, Rua. So um, as, as Rua was talking about, you know, Rua and I have been working on, on map of these indicators. So we wanted to share with you um, this particular indicator, Acre of Interior Natural Communities. And the way we want to share this, which might, might not be a surprise for you all, is through our Conservation Planning Atlas. And so um, if, if you've then um, on our last webinar, you know that we have a, a conservation planning atlas, which is a platform where we can share this type of information. And I wanted to show you really quickly, sorry, I lost my tab, how you can get to this information. And so if you go to our home page, the, the southatlanticlcc.org, if you click on the conservation blueprint and then uh, click on indicators, Here's where you get to the indicators page, which has all the information Rue has been talking about, and it also has this link to view draft GIS layers for indicators. So if you go ahead and click on that, that will take you to a group that we've set up on our conservation planning atlas where we're going to be loading up our very draft versions of indicators as they become available. And so you can see here um, in the description of the group, I'm, I keep on pointing out that these are very draft versions. We don't want to make conservation decisions on these at this time. But we want to provide these, like Rua said, to keep everyone informed on how we're planning to map indicators, to get your involvement and feedback, to let us know if you think this is a useful or appropriate way to map the status of indicators, and also just kind of communicate with you the challenges that we may face as we move forward with this. And this is a new platform, and we're still kind of figuring out the best ways to use it. So right now, I've just loaded up one indicator, this draft um, acres of interior natural communities. And I went ahead, and you can click on it if you were live on the page here. You could click on it. But I just went ahead and opened it up in the map because we're having some slow draw times right now that we're trying to work out. And so if you click on this indicator, you can see I've loaded up just um, the, the geographic area of the South Atlantic, and you'll notice that we're including the, the ACF basin in that area when we do our indicator mapping. And here you can see the, the years that Rua spoke of. We have the 1992 NLCD, 
where we've uh, looked at the uh, interior natural community patches. So uh, this first layer that you're looking at right now shows patches by acre. And um, if you scroll through, uh, I was loading these kind of quickly, and I wanted to point out um, I, I didn't get these scaled exactly the same. And I'm currently, it's running right now, I'm reloading it so that these colors will match up in the comparison years. Um, that you'll see, you can look at currently the draft 1992, the 2001, and the 2000. And again, I'm going to fix that color so you can compare those. And then we've also, the other layer in this package that we're sharing with you is just um, a reclassified layer showing um, those patches that meet the 10,000 acre target that we've set. And um, as I said, we're having some, some slow draw times this morning that we're working on, uh, but we're excited to use this platform to share this information with you. Also, as we move forward, I'm going to be uploading some supporting documents that list out the steps we use, the data sets that we use um, for inputs, and also the steps that we use in order to map these. We have some known issues um, in comparing different years for the national land cover data. In 2006, that land cover product has some roads that are burned in. And so that's going to impact how our patch sizes are created. And then also, as Rua mentioned, for our future land cover, we're using um, the urban growth, the sleuth model, and the SLAM models that are created for our area. And we're actually burning those into the 2006 land cover. And there are some issues that are going to come about you know, by putting all these data sets together, as I'm sure uh, many of you who have worked with GIS know. Um, sometimes data sets are easier to compare than others. And so it's, we're very excited to get your feedback on how we're putting these together and the results that we're coming up with. And so it's taking, I'm having some slow draw times this morning, so I think I'll just open it up for any questions that you all have, or we pass it back to Rua. Yeah, what we're going to do, since we're, we're talking about a few different indicators from a number of different places, um, we're just going to go ahead and open it up quickly for any questions about particular indicator models, and then um, after the different ones we talk about and then leave other questions for the end. So if you have any immediate questions about this particular indicator or, or comments, um, just go ahead and, what is it, star six to unmute yourself? Yeah, it's star six, Ro. Cool. But just go ahead and to unmute yourself if you have any immediate questions. Um, and then if not, we'll move on to the next one. All right, well, you still have time to ask questions um, at the end of the presentation. I'm going to go ahead and pass it back to Rua. Excellent. So I'm going to go ahead and run you through a few more of the ones in the works here. So I had a backup plan for interior natural communities. <laughs> <laughs> You never, you never know with technology. I always like to be prepared. Um, all right, so I'm going to show you an uh, example from the marine system. So now we've got a, a collection of species here. So this is the nearshore forage fish. So this one is designed particularly to capture the bottom of the food chain in the marine ecosystem. Uh, so detail-wise, we're talking about the combined density of spot croaker, Atlantic croaker, and southern croaker. Um, the target here is to maintain the, the density for each species within one standard deviation of the historic mean. So this is sort of a long term, we want to keep it here. And the data we're using so far is based on um, CMAP for both past and current. And then the future right now, we're working on um, incorporating some of the rain shift models from Aquamaps and extrapolating some of the current trends uh, into the future. So I'll show you some of the past and current right now. So this is the CMAP sampling we have so far um, incorporated. And oops. OK. Um, this is what we have so far. And these are the subsections, Raleigh Bay down to Florida. I'll show you a graph going from 99 to 2007. Um, so this is the index, 
index itself combined of all those species, so combined densities on the y-axis. That really dark line is for the entire region, and the other colored lines are for the subregions, so how they've been doing from sort of past to current. And so since we have a target, we can actually time that into uh, basically a stoplight indicator. So you know, we had this, we want to keep the density within one standard deviation of historic mean. And so look, we're 1999 to 2007. The very top is this, this South Atlantic region. And then bottom is Raleigh Bay all the way down to Florida. And so what you see is that the yellows are when you know, one species dropped below the historic standard deviation, uh, but not all of them, and the green is when all species were within one standard deviation of the historic mean. So from that, over this period, we can take our, our target and say, our forage fish indicator is in relatively good condition, um, which is actually unusual compared to the other indicators we've looked at, because everything else is, is, uh, has been pretty scary. So that's an example we're trying to get to on, on you know, roll these things up more towards a, a stoplight kind of measure. So um, that's near shore forage fish. Um, any immediate questions on that indicator itself? And again, star six to unmute yourself. This is John Bastini. Uh, hey, Doc. So on this indicator, what, it, what would be uh, what would be red? Would it be all the all, all the species uh, uh, that are outside of the range, or I mean, you know, you said yellow was one or more, or, or is one species? So, so let's. I guess I'm I'm not clear on what the uh, what the what the indicator what what your criteria are. Yeah. So the, the target so the target itself was to have all of them within. Um, right. deviation of the historic mean. And so basically the way it's set right now, green is, they're all there, yellow is, one's outside, and then red is two or more. We oh. don't have anywhere two or more have been below. So, you know, one, you know, that happens every once in a while. You could see some of the fluctuations in individual species that happens. But So that's sort of, a, okay, keep an eye on it. But once we get two or more, then it's, all right, we got to watch out. <laughs> Okay, right. Yeah, well, that's, that looks that's surprisingly good, as you mentioned. She said. Yeah, I was shocked, especially looking at some of these other ones. I was like, oh my god, wait, we have something that has some green in it. Yay. <laughs> so, but that's why we're trying, you know, part of this is trying to get out as we're going, as we're modeling, make sure anyone that has a time that wants to sort of look in and, and say, hey, this makes sense, this doesn't make sense, or in these particular areas, this does, you know, this doesn't make sense, so we can, we can catch it as we go. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, other questions on this one? All right. Excellent. Um, if you have some, can always you can always ask them at the end as well. Just trying to give give folks some space here. Right. Okay. So next one I'm going to bring up. We we haven't fully summarized this one yet, um, but wanted to give you a direction on on where we're getting some of the data for future. Um, so freshwater aquatic, I actually have two of them. Um, the freshwater aquatic, we have the impervious surface. Uh, so this was trying to capture both some water quality and flow components of the uh, aquatic system. And so details, number of catchments with 10% or less impervious surface. Uh, so that's what this indicator is about. And the target was to maintain the number of catchments with 10% or less. Um, I mean, folks, especially in discussion, said there's no way in the world we're going to really reduce it given the huge growth in here. But if we can hold the line and maybe you know, do some restoration in some places, that, that we might be able to get to that. Um, so the, the data we're using right now, uh, past and current from the NLCD, 2001-2006. And then from the future, we don't have the detailed urbanization predictions from the sleuth. So um, we're using the iClues out of the uh, EPA office uh, their future impervious surface models. So I'm going to give you a, a quick peek into what these look like. This isn't summarized by catchment yet. This is just impervious surface. Um, so basically anything, at this point, anything that's not blue <laughs> uh, is is a one kilometer pixel that's you know, greater than 10% impervious surface. So once you get into red, you're talking more like 50% plus. 
Um, yellows are more around the 25 percent range. So this is 2010. Um, you know, you can you can see across the our, our major urban areas lighting up pretty strongly here, and then moving into 2050. Major, the major growth in some of the impervious surface uh, based on those models is happening around these major urban centers. So not as much as, as you would expect in, in some of the rural areas where the growth has been a lot slower, um, you know, we're not having as huge of a jump in impervious surface as we are in some of the really big urban centers. So right now we're going to, um, the next step here is to just summarize this based on NHP plus catchments and use that 10% threshold. Um, and so we're going to be doing that back, you know, going 2001, 2006, and then we have the future steps on the impervious surface through this ICLUS. So, um, questions on modeling the future of impervious surface? Again, star six, if you need to unmute yourself. Yeah, really, this is, this is John again. Mm -hmm. uh, can, can you ask the previous slide? I, I do have some questions on this one. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, uh, the, the catchments, uh, what, what scale are we talking? Fan IC plus catchments. Oh, these are so pretty fine scale. Okay. Yeah. So, I guess the what, you know, first question is, you know, does that see, how realistic does that seem in sort of stopping, develop, you know, development in its tracks? I mean, that's, uh, that, that, that's pretty hard to, uh, hard to imagine that's an achievable uh, goal that you're not going to have any, any cross that threshold. Um, so I'm not sure, if, you know, what the, if, if that's, a, I guess that's, a, that's just an observation or a, a, a discussion point, I guess, you know, is that really a realistic um, uh, objective? Um, and then the other, the, 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 another question is with the data. Um, so the NLCD doesn't actually have, as far as I'm aware, it doesn't have Impervious service, is there some sort of a, a model you're using to relate that, or, or is there, I mean, it's, it's the land cover types that have some ranges, I think, but how are you relating that to the, to the future data? Because I'm, I'm wondering if there's kind of an apples and oranges comparison there, or how you feel, how, how confident you feel about that comparison and, uh, and the impervious service attributed to the NLCD land covers. Yeah, so I'll take the, uh, both of the, the first one related to the target. Um, you know, the very, so we have this uh, testing and revision process for the indicators and targets. And so the very first part, so in this first year, um, and the reason why we're going rapidly through modeling sort of current and future is to do exactly what you're talking about. So, I mean, there are some ways you can actually reduce impervious surface in a watershed, you know, working on more impervious surfaces with communities and things like that. Um, but. The idea here for all these targets is to then put them through the very first filter on is this even doable, and then adjust based on this set state of the South Atlantic. So I think we're going to run into a number of these targets where people said, yeah, I think we might be able to do this. And then once we look at the future conditions and look at what's doable and what it might take to get there, that's when we collectively, and so we have it set up for a yearly revision process. So, you know, back in, in so in March, we're going to be working on looking at those targets and revising them. Um, so I think that's, that's the point of doing this, uh, to see what's, what's doable and what's not. Um, and then the second one related to the impervious surface, um, and Amy, correct me if I'm wrong, because she's looked at these a little more deeply, um, my understanding is that in 2001, 2006, there actually is an impervious surface layer that was calculated directly that came from, there's, there are two different layers. There's the their NLCD, the land cover itself, but also there's an impervious layer for 2001 and 2006. Oh. Isn't that right, Amy? Yeah, Lou, well, that's correct. They do have, a, they call it percent developed imperviousness uh, for 2001 and 2006. Um, the issue of whether it's comparable with the, the future data is something that we definitely want our, you know, our community to, to have some input on because, um, you know, there's difference between between observed uh, from satellite imagery and modeled future data. So. Yeah, and that's been the big, that's been a lot of the work and the you know, sort of the, the adventures of, of doing the past, current, and future is trying to seam up, and I've been, Amy's been working on this one a lot, it's like how do, you, how do you seam up the sort of past where you actually have the satellite data into the future projections in a way that's logical, you know, that we put in. Um, so that's, that's a, 
that's part of the adventure of putting these things together. <laughs> <laughs> right, and, and it's going to be difficult um, to, to, for example, to re with the land cover data, you're not going to capture some of those things that you, you, know, you could do to reduce uh, inverteousness, like using pervious pavement and, and such. That that would be hard to cover to capture with with, with uh, remote sense data. Yeah. So yep. another challenge. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, well, this is this is Scott Robinson. I, I think it would be good if you know that's for the future. Uh, we could figure out a way to incorporate some of those mitigation tactics, like storm, you know, there's some creative stormwater management techniques now that that uh, help alleviate some of that. Just something to think about for the future. I know mean, that's tough to work in the regional models, but uh, certainly something to consider anyway. <laughs> And you'll see it too, and I'll, I'll talk real quick at the end here about the sort of the, the blueprint framework, but one of the things we're going to is going beyond just a simple, here are the best places to take action, but if you remember when we talk, it, but also the actions. So, you know, we'll have, it'll most likely be a fairly broad sort of, you know, water management in this place, um, and then to step down part of the blueprint about what kind of management we do um, you know, this, this sort of a stormwater or pervious surfaces or things like that. Um, so I think there are going to be ways of, of nesting that in as far as actual actions we do. Oh, nice. Mm -hmm. Very good. Yep. All right. Um, any other questions on this one? Mm -hmm. oh, I'll move on to the next one. Um, so that was the impervious surface, showed that one. Okay, so the next one in the freshwater aquatic to try to capture some of the, um, try to capture components of water quality that weren't going to be captured, quality and flow by the um, impervious surface was looking at the index of biotic integrity. Um, so this is the, the piece that's used as biocriteria for the 303D assessments. Um, this is a really interesting back and forth long uh, sort of discussion uh, on, on how you capture this component. Do you do sort of endemics? Do you do threatened and endangered species? Do you do the IBI? And went back and forth on the pluses and minuses of this one. Um, and so a lot of those assumptions are going to be uh, tested pretty soon in some of the indicator testing, um, but ended up with a, this index of biotic integrity. And the target is to double the area within each LCC state. Um, ranked at least good, so within the South Atlantic. And so the reason, as you all know, is that the, the, the criteria and the indices are different across states. So it was really all about the change within states instead of trying to look at the raw numbers across states, which are just not really comparable at all. Um, so trying to double the area within each of these states, it's ranked at least good. Um, so the data so far, um, been coming at this in a few different directions, um, both from the state programs up and then from some of the EPA assessments down. Um, so the best we have so far, um, what we've been working with is pulling the, the 305B assessments. Um, so for the past, the, the 2004, because that's as far as North Carolina goes back. Um, and then the current, looking at the most recent assessments. Um, 2010, and then in the future, uh, I have this as a, a future plug, I've got to connect with some of the EPA um, water program folks and Office of Research and Development to see if we have any good models that can connect land cover to um, some of these um, impairments. So the future is still kind of a question mark um, to work on. I know it's been done in some regions and places, but I'm not sure how much good coverage we have here yet. So that's I'm going to give you an example. Um, so here's cumulative change in areas ranked good um, as far as aquatic life support. And this is percent change from 2004 to 2010. I thought I'd do a different visualization instead of a graph just to mix it up. Um, so you've got North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia. So this is percent changes. And um, so the, the red is kind of gone backwards. <laughs> the, Orange is you've got some kind of increase in green is, you know, all right, we're on track to, to, to our target of, of doubling some of the areas. 
And so you see in North Carolina over that period, there's been a small percentage increase. I'm going to talk about why that might be a little quirky in a second. Um, South Carolina has actually declined over time. Um, and Georgia has been bouncing back and forth, but has stayed pretty stable. Um, so this is super draft, and actually there's some of the mountain watersheds in here that I still haven't fully pulled out yet, um, but just wanted to give you a flavor of um, how this might be translated. And then if you dig deeper into some of the aquatic pieces, um, so orange is, or blue is North Carolina, red is South Carolina, green is Georgia, and so now I've got it chopped up into segments, 2004, 2006, 2006, 2008, 2008 to 2010. Um, what you see in the North Carolina is a giant leap over changes, and so there's something quirky going on, and I know they changed some of their method, their, you know, some of the methodologies, so I'm going to talk to some of the folks with the Diener about that particular one. Um, but, you know, you're sort of seeing, here's, here are the overall changes in, in what's ranked good um, over time. So basically, um, 2008, every, everyone had a little bit of an increase, and there's some weirdness in North Carolina. So that's just a real start in trying to dig into the IBIs and make them work across the different state boundaries. So any um, questions about that one? Again, star six to unmute your line. Hey, y'all, this is Sam Okay. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, I have a question about, um, and it's specific to North Carolina, but I assume that it, it can go over the whole landscape. Um, so the IBI is like, it's only calculated, at least it goes, to, we go to our basins about every five years. So how, is this going to be assessed annually? So like you're, you're tracking things annually to see if we're getting to our, I hope I'm using the right terminology, but we're getting, we're making progress to our target. Mm -hmm. Is that right? What, so how, how do you factor in the fact that, they, that these are really not even assessed but every five years? Yeah, so some, we have, there's a mix of, so we're doing our best first cut um, depending on those data, um, you know, for the, you know, whatever we have as a past sort of baseline into the, into the future. Um, and, but some of these measures, another example of that is the index of coastal condition I talked about before, estrin, and that's every five years. So we have a number of things that are assessed every year, some things that are assessed every three years or so, like land fire with their updates, and some things every five. So we're not going to have refresh cycles on everything um, every year. Um, so it's just working out the best way to, to to regularly sort of update on our report card. And yeah, and that's some of the challenges of working with this data about, you know, some of the places that are, are sampled are at sort of a larger scale than, than just a catchment kind of thing. So um, yeah, there are definitely some 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 sort of temporal challenges that, that make things a little bumpy. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Hey Maria, I just this is Louise. I just had a real quick question, and I'm sure you guys have already factored this in, but when you're looking at um, streams on the 303D list and the ones you're looking at trying to double the ones that are in good, um, is there a category that's above good, like excellent, and, and you wouldn't be counting those, like for example, you wouldn't want more good, less excellent, right? Yeah, so the way that the target um, we're shooting for was at least good. So, you know, excellent is better, but we didn't have it as a scaled kind of thing. And so it, and it all depends on how you, the more detailed you want to break that in, the harder it is to be consistent across. Um, so, for example, you know, it, then when you get into North Carolina, you've got, like, good, you've got good fair, you've got fair. Um, but every state does it differently, mm -hmm. and every state has different categories. Mm -hmm. um, so it gets, the more detailed you get above good or better, mm -hmm. the more erraticiness you sort of get from state to state. And so you uh, you aggregated what constitutes good across all the states? Well, in this case, there is an aggregation for good across all the states that already happens. Okay. Um, so it's already aggregated as good, but then you can split down into more detailed um, measures once you get down state by state. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, this is John Dusty again. Mm -hmm. Just uh, one thought. Um, talking about IBIs and streams, it, it are, have, has the uh, has the LCC looked at uh, or thought uh, at the at the uh, the EPA's um, the Ruben's, uh, the Ruben stream assessment uh, information because there's a lot of good metrics in there, and that's a national assessment. But there's probably enough data points within the LCC geography. Uh, to, to actually look at trends, and that's on a, I believe it's a five-year or so uh, cycle. Yeah, that's one thing we talked about. Um, it wasn't quite, um, at least the first run of that wasn't fully ready yet, but that's going to be the, one of the things we can test in the future for, you know, as we go through and say, okay, well, here's what we got from IBI, here's the, the like, the goods and the bads, and is there another assessment that we could use that would work better? Um, so, so yeah, that's definitely on the list of things that came up in their in the indicated review process, and something we're going to see about. You know, okay, well, will this work better into the future to capture the same thing? Because um, that's a nice. I mean, the other EPA has a number. Then they also have one for wetlands that was uh, part of the discussion for testing too. That that's almost ready. Um, so right. Yeah. So that's we also, yeah. We have an estuarine uh, assessment. Yeah. Well, but anyway, yeah, it's, it's good because it, it, it's good in that it's consistent across the, the yeah. geography, so it w wouldn't have the state state issues in the same way. Yeah, yeah, and so the and the um, the the one they have for the EPA has for the estuary was the one I mentioned. That's the the indicator of coastal condition. Oh, okay. Uh, so that's the one we we already using for for that piece. But but yeah, and I think that's the idea of having these you know yearly testing and revision. So. You know, we can try to work with things, and if we find better stuff, or if new stuff comes along, then then we can work on swapping them out. Right. All right. Um, okay, so I'm going to go ahead now and um, move on here just real quick for the end. Talk about sort of the next steps for the conservation blueprint. Um, so I talked earlier about those landscape scale stressors. Um, that are, we're trying to incorporate moving into the future. So for the blueprint, then it's a matter of putting your conservation actions in between. So now we have a series. This is, again, standard action uh, taxonomy from the open standards, also working for all the Southeast LCCs to use the same terminology. So now we have folded in the land and water protection. So where are the places we need to do easements and acquisition, land and water management. So where are the places we need to burn, you know, or or like Scott was mentioning before, you know, stormwater issues or um, if this also if things like fish passage fit into the water management and in-stream flow. Species management, this is about reintroduction where we might need to reintroduce things like, you know, mussels and others for the integrity. Um, education and awareness, you know, that's what you're outreaching to sort of homeowners and things on stormwater, uh, livelihood and economic and other incentives. So this is, you know, we're 90% private land here in the South Atlantic, so this is all about, you know, working forests and what are the incentives, economic incentives we can use and where do we need to put those. And then finally, the external capacity building. So that's stuff like joint fire strike teams and joint water teams and, and things like that. So figuring out where on the landscape we need to put some of these different broad actions. And then running it through our ecosystem integrity filter about what we get uh, with respect to our indicators and targets. So getting to version 2.0, we have a conservation design team that spun up. We just finished the second meeting of them. These are the, the think tank of technical experts in large landscape conservation design. Um, and we got going to be spinning up a modeling team. So we've already mentioned some of the early modeling issues. So um, Amy's going to be leading up that. This is folks that have developed some of these models we're working with and folks from other partnerships that have done um, these different types of modeling efforts. And then the user team, which is folks that are interested in using information from version 1.0 of the blueprint, um, and either directly are making decisions or are like one step away from supporting individuals that do. So I've been doing a bunch of interviews with people potentially for this team, just getting a feel for what are you using right now for designs, what's working well, what's not. Um, so that's that's those two are still forming, um, but been doing a lot of interviews with decision makers related to the blueprint. Here's the folks on the design team right now. Actually, I've got one other person to add, Dean Urban um, from, from Duke. 
And so this is, you know, try to cut across folks that work on marine, terrestrial, and freshwater. Um, and also we got a number of folks like uh, Jim Fox and Dean Urban and Will Allen that work with urban communities on things like green infrastructure, vitality indices, stuff like that. Um, so we got a good mix of smarty pants folks. And here's the timeline. So March, the indicators were approved. So right now we're doing the first web forum about the indicator models, just giving you an idea of, 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 of where things are going and what we have so far. Um, July, we're going to do another web forum on the indicator models, focusing on particularly some of the connectivity models, let you look at those and review and get some more background on that, um, probably show you some more indicators as well. And then in August, we're shooting to have the draft state of the South Atlantic, so past, current, future condition of, um, of all the South Atlantic indicators. There may be one or two that, that we thought we could model, but we can't, but we're going to try to cover as many of them as possible. Then October, November, we're going to have some fun regional workshops to guide the blueprint design. So these should be um, pretty interactive. Right now, we're planning to have, you know, two open to anyone in the cooperative. Um, you know, probably Raleigh and Savannah sometime in October or November. Um, so these will be pretty interactive, where you'll get your hands on some of the data sets and be able to have some discussions and look at some potential ways of putting it together to make a blueprint. Um, so. Then in January, we're shooting to have the State of the South Atlantic complete and also a draft conservation blueprint released for particularly folks in the steering committee to do one last organizational review um, and all of you to take a look at it yet again. And then in March, we're shooting to have 1.0 complete. So 1.0 will definitely not be perfect, um, but the plan is to have a sort of an actionable core, which is a sort of you know, these are, these are ready to go on, um, and then some more um, speculative sort of high risk, high rewards. Here are some places you might want to think about going um, kind of thing. So we're shooting for, like I said, 1.0, and just like everything we do, have a process to, to revise and update as we go. All right, so on to, actually before we do that, um, actually we only got about five more minutes here. so. Um, if folks have any questions um, related to that, let me think here. Um, so we don't have a lot more time. One thing I want to do then, before we even go to the updates, is one thing we try to do is on these forums give folks a chance to ask any questions about the cooperative in general. So, you know, not necessarily even about the talk, but if you have some kind of question about the cooperative um, that's not part of this talk or hasn't been covered, um, we want to give you a chance to sort of ask that more broadly. Um, and then after that, we'll, we'll go through some quick updates. So does anyone have something, any, any broader questions about the South Atlantic, where is it going, um, not necessarily related to this? Feel free to star six to unmute yourself. Okay, so um, hearing none, uh, maybe we'll take one more question on the uh, on what I just talked about and then quickly move through the updates. So Ken, looks like you got your, your hand raised over there. So you can star six your line to unmute yourself. What are you talking about me, Ken McDonald? Oh, sorry, uh, Ken Reckow. Sorry, wrong Ken. Too many Kens. Ken, I noticed you got your hand raised up there. I didn't know if you had a, a question. Ken Reckow. <laughs> Or are you on you trying to talk like I usually do? <laughs> I'm not hearing. I'm not hearing Ken wreck out. Um, so maybe maybe we can follow up, Ken, um, if you've got if you got a particular question. All right. Um, so any other questions about what I just talked about. If not, we'll move on to some very quick updates. All 
All right. Well, feel free to email or call me or Amy with any other questions you might have about anything we just talked about. So, Ken, you're up. Yeah, Ken McDermott. Thanks for that, Amy. Good, <laughs> great, great job. Can you hear me now? Yep. Okay. Uh, real quickly, so I just, uh, and real thanks for opening up, because I think that is the most important. A lot of these updates will show up in our website or other places, newsletters and things, but um, I think it really is important that, that we give you all an opportunity that you've taken the time to participate in these uh, web forums and other ways. But just real quickly, just bring your attention to the fact that there's been a national fish wildlife and plant climate adaptation strategy released, I think it was in March. Um, I did a blog on that on our website back in May. You can take a look at that and get the links to it if you haven't seen it already. And I just want to let you know that the cooperative um, through the steering committee and, and uh, Marsha Williams is our chair who I think is on the call, sent a letter back to the management team for that fish, wildlife, and plant climate adaptation strategy. And that's um, federal and state um, folks and NGOs. There's a lot of people involved in that. But anyway, we sent a letter basically recommending the folks for putting that together and specifically identifying how this cooperative can help uh, implement some parts of that strategy that actually line up really well with our strategic plan and our mission. Um, and, and most importantly is related to the blueprint and the call for a, an ecologically connected network of, of habitats um, throughout the, the country. And so that one we line up really well as, as well as some other ones. And I'll get that letter um, on the website very quickly. And then secondly, just want to let you know, um, in the area of coordination across LCCs, that the Gulf Coast LCCs are um, just about ready to send a letter from all of our steering committees, um, one letter to the Gulf Restoration Council, who's working on uh, a comprehensive restoration plan for the Gulf, uh, the response to the oil spill, and uh, we're basically sending a letter saying that the, the cooperatives stand ready to help our niche and conservation planning to be helpful to the, the work that the Restoration Council is doing and just making sure that, that um, they know that the cooperatives are in place and are a great forum for cooperating across organizations. And then lastly, just to let you know, um, the staff um, from the LCC and uh, some of our uh, student members like Marshall and Mike Harris from Georgia spent some time a in Atlanta and surrounding areas last week doing a a quite a few briefings for some organizations, some ones that we've met before and that are part of the cooperative already, but some other ones that, that haven't actually had a chance to, we haven't had a chance to talk to. So that was really helpful and we're going to try to do that uh, a little bit more and, and we, there's some areas that we haven't yet uh, geographically yet that we need to do a better job on as well. But just like to know that we are trying to work to make sure that people are updated about what the cooperative is doing to make sure folks know that they have an opportunity to be engaged and participate and that the, that the doors are wide open. And with that, I'll, I'll, I'll stop and see if anybody has any questions, if that's still any, any uh, questions or comments. All right, well, listen, I'll turn it back to Larry, and I think we'll close out here pretty quick, thank you. Thank you, Larry. Thanks, Larry. Well, hi, everybody. Uh, Larry Bowman, Bowman third Thursday South Atlantic LCC Web Forum. Um, as you mentioned, next week we'll be hosting another one on some of the connectivity models. Um, and just to mention, there's many ways that you can get involved with your South Atlantic LCC. Um, please feel free to join the website and web community where you'll get um, monthly updates. I won't bug you at first, just with one um, update on the newsletter. Uh, connect with a staff member. You can find our contact information on the site or communicate with your steering committee to get involved. Um, and get your organization involved. So I want to thank everybody for attending. Um, and again, if anybody has any more questions, we'll open it up now. Um, remember to star six to, um, to speak. <laughs> Hello, is this Ken Rack? Can you hear me? Hey, Ken. <laughs> we got gotcha. you. Uh, I don't know what, what uh, happened, but uh, I, I have a uh, comment um, on the uh, on the uh, Stream River IBI. I didn't I didn't catch all of that because Bert Eisenkopf took me off for a few minutes. But uh, I got gotcha. you. I've got a project that I'm just beginning, um, looking using the BayesNet uh, causal analysis to assess the uh, relationship between nutrient levels and stream macroinvertebrates. 
Uh, in fact, I posted a blog. I had a blog, blog post on the blog I've been doing for the past month and a half on this issue because my sense is there's not much relationship uh, from what I've seen other people doing, other studies. And I was in uh, D.C. talking to Betsy Sutherland and uh, uh, Alan Gornsky, Mike Shapiro, about this, and there seems to be now some agreement that uh, nutrients, mentioned phosphorus, within the range of what's found in, in natural water bodies are not uh, important for things for affecting um, macrocarbon indices. Mm, really? Um, and, and so they're, they're, you know, they've seen EPA with its guidance document, and I overheard someone mention it, uh, uh, is, some, is going down the wrong path. And I think, as I say, they're beginning to recognize that, that they need other bioindicators besides street macro invertebrates. But in any event, I'm just starting a project, and uh, I'll be looking at data in, um, in Wisconsin, probably New England, uh, probably Ohio, and maybe North Carolina to uh, do a base net model and see what the strength of the causal relationships are. That's something I'm going to be doing over the next year or so. And I do have a blog post on that, on, on what I've found thus far on, on that topic. So if anyone's interested, I'll provide a link to that. Oh, that's, that's perfect. And I'll, I'll, um, I'll make sure Bill, Bill Pine, who's going to be working on um, the aquatic, testing these aquatic indicators um, knows about that work too, so it can be can be folded in. And that's great because I know you have you did some of those um, Bayesian uh, parameterizations of the Sparrow models for Eastern North Carolina, right? So you build yeah, on that fact, work. I'm working on that. This is out of our region, but I'm working on that right now on, a, on another project on the station in uh, Western Lake Erie with a Bayesian Sparrow type model. Uh, so. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll send you an email with the link to the blog post, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll keep you informed as we talk about our other you know, project we're working with you uh, um, now. Yeah, sounds, sounds perfect. All right, thanks a lot, everyone. See you in a month.